Uh, Carlos, you're you're on. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to all. Welcome to this webinar: solutions to scale a green sustainable development in the Amazon. Uh, welcome all of you. I will pass on the word to Coimbra, who will be moderating this webinar. Coimbra, please. This is Coimbra Sirica. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. So welcome to this webinar organized by the Science Panel for the Amazon. Uh, today we will have uh, we have a very exciting group of uh, people speaking. Um, the webinar will begin at uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, or was supposed to begin at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and then it will go on for an hour and a half, or two hours actually. Um, so we're going to start with uh, uh, Carlos Nobre is going to uh, uh, open the uh, conference, and uh, then we will um, we will have. Uh, uh, Mr. Guillermo uh, Leal, the co-founder of Natura and a member of the SPA Strategic Committee. Uh, we will have Ms. Andrea Alvarez, Natura's Vice President of Branding and Innovation, uh, Internalization and Sustainability, and Dr. Susanna Hecht, Professor at the University of California, also a member of the Science Panel for the Amazon, as well as Professor Ricardo Abramove at the University of Sao Paulo and a member of the Science Panel for the Amazon. Uh, so I think what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll start with this first panel, which is uh, uh, going to be on uh, the innovative bioeconomy of forests uh, standing and rivers flowing. And uh, I'll, I'll introduce the speakers for each session. So that's the first group starting uh, starting now. Um. Should I go on, Coimbra? Yes. Why don't you? Uh, you could you could go ahead and introduce this panel. Perhaps uh, maybe say uh, uh, what you see the goal of it as being. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yesterday, let me start just by quoting uh, this chieftain, the indigenous Kayapo chieftain, Bepi Proti Meka Granyoti Re. Uh, he said in an article in the, in the newspaper, uh, The Guardian, that uh, two models of development were currently facing off in the Amazon. The development of destruction and the, the sustainable development of construction and knowledge. I, I think it was a very wise statement, uh, because for the last 50 years, the resource-intensive development model adopted by most Amazonian countries particularly initiated in Brazil, has led to a massive destruction of the rainforest and spread poverty across the basin. It's urgent to find the sustainable development of construction instead of destruction, based on knowledge. So uh, the, the aims of this webinar, uh, as you've seen in the announcement, discuss sustainable development pathways for the Amazon, highlight synergies between different types of knowledge and an interdisciplinary approach to develop practical integrated solutions and also engage potential partners that share the vision of a protected and productive forest a protected uh, productive amazon uh, fortunately for the first time in 500 years since the europeans came to south america we are starting to seek an alternative way to appreciate the way of living of indigenous people for 12,000 years. And we are going to also to, to hear the vision of an indigenous leader uh, in the webinar. That, that is to see value in the standing forest with its immense biodiversity in its terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. There is plenty of evidence that a standing forest flowing rivers by economy, that's the, the kind of a short sentence uh, for this new bioeconomy, can be vibrant and also socially inclusive, improving the well-being of Amazonian populations and including the economy of the Amazonian 
countries. We have a number of examples, uh, and I'm sure uh, Guilherme Leal and Andrea will give beautiful examples that we have a Brazilian company, Natura. Uh, uh, just examples of how you can maintain the force and still develop the economy. We have also, of course, these new forest products from the Amazon. Acai Berry brings more than one billion dollars a year to the to the Amazon economy. Improved the well-being of something like 300,000 people, uh, and also a few other uh, cacao, Brazil nuts, and a few other products. Uh, but still, very far from the potential. Also, I think it's important to to keep in mind something that the pandemic uh, raised to the level of maximum concern globally, which is the risk of pandemics. We had two pandemics in 20th century, and we have had two pandemics per dec decade this century, including this uh, huge destructive uh, COVID-19. So it's clear today what science and what traditional populations have been saying and claiming for a long time, the necessity, absolute necessity to preserve all tropical forests and restore ecological balance. So post pandemic, the Green New Deal calls for a full fledged protection of all tropical rainforests and particularly the Amazon where we still have the largest tropical forest in the planet. But of course, it's a huge challenge to construct the pathways for such social biodiversity driven, sustainable development paradigm for the Amazon. In sum, this is this first webinar promoted by the science panel for the Amazon wants to shed some light on how to move to solution spaces and how to combine ingeniously scientific knowledge with traditional knowledge. So uh, that's the goal of this first uh, webinar and we are going to proceed and we're going to have many such discussions and how to give a scale, how to bring some of these initial ideas, initial examples that are working very well of a uh, standing forest flowing rivers by economy to reach scales initially in the Amazon, but could serve as a role model for all tropical forests of the planet. So let me uh, then give the, the floor back to our moderator, Coimbra, please, to introduce our speakers. Hello. So to, uh, to uh, return to our uh, speakers, we want to open now the uh, panel discussion on the innovative bioeconomy of forest standing and rivers flowing. Mm -hmm. So again, this is Mr. Guillermo Leal, uh, Ms. Andrea Alvarez, uh, they're with, both with Natura, and, uh, and then we have Dr. Susanna Hecht at the University of California, and uh, Professor um, um, Abramove at the University of Sao Paulo. Please go ahead. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> are you listen? Are you are you hearing me? Yes. <laughs> okay. G great. I am not seeing you, but <laughs> it's a pleasure. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Carlos and all the the organizers of the the the, the, the science panel uh, for the invitation to share some of our experiences in the, the Amazon region. For those that don't know Natura, uh, we were born 51 years ago in Sao Paulo as a garage company with an initial investment than less than $10,000. Then, uh, uh, today we are as Natura and Co that we Brought, including the, the the new brands that we brought together, uh, like Avon, the Body Shop, and uh, uh, Aesop, the, an Austra Australian brand. We are present presently in more than a hundred different countries, with uh, six million representatives 
and 4, 000, around 4,000 uh, stores. Uh, our long story was designed uh, based on some deep values. The first of, uh, of them, uh, the central one, is the interdependency among all of us, human be living beings. Uh, we are deeply convinced since a long, long time uh, that uh, we are all one great earth. Uh, we are, uh, uh, we influence and uh, are influenced by the, the, the action of everyone. The second, one of the second deep values is the richness of diversity. We have been for a long time in, it was 92, 1992, uh, at the, the same time of the uh, Rio 92, when we wrote down our, uh, these, those beliefs and diversity, it was one of the, 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 the main uh, uh, values that we 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 committed to the the a third one that is important for our analysis is that uh, it was that companies are uh, change agents uh, they are uh, it's it's part of the whole of the business to promote uh, positive change in, in society, in the, in the communities that we they work on, uh, and, the, and the belief that the prosperity and longevity of the companies are deeply connected to the, uh, to, to the deliver of social and environmental positive impact. Uh, 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 and this will make companies be profitable and long uh, and uh, uh, older uh, and, and to, to stay through the time. To share uh, uh, these beliefs, to share the, those, as I said, the, the, it was 92 when we wrote down this, those commitments. Uh, and we have been since then trying to make them reality, not just speech. Uh, we have been part uh, uh, in the, of many movements uh, uh, to spread this kind of perception uh, and beliefs that a companies has a whole, a different whole, not only to generate profit. And we have been part of many movements like uh, the creation in 98 of the ETHOS Institute for Responsible uh, uh, Business. Uh, it was a way to, to help to, to, to promote this kind of uh, 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 behavior among the companies. Our connection, connection to the Amazon region grows when we were almost 30 years old. It was 20 plus years ago. At the end of last century, late 90s, we were reflecting that uh, about what we would like to be when we became adults. <laughs> we were thinking about 20, 50 years ahead and uh, asking ourselves what we would like to, to, to how we would like to be recognized. Uh, and after a deep thought, uh, huge discussions, we came to the obvious conclusion that to honor our name, Natura, and our origins, Brazil, we should get closer to the Amazon and understand how to use in a sustainable way the richness, the ultra-rich biodiversity of the region, creating terrific products to our consumers, bringing prosperity to some of its inhabitants, and helping 
to conserve the forest. In 2000, uh, as part of this movement, we launched the line ECHOES, uh, that is based on natural ingredients from the Amazon. Our conclusion after experience that Andrea is going to share with us, it is that it is difficult, challenging, but possible for a company to succeed in exploiting in a fair and sustainable way the richness of the region. Even though to promote the change that we really need for this huge and precious and complex region, we need to involve much more than good companies, more than business businesses. We need to bring together to dialogue the many stakeholders, local people, indigenous communities, uh, local business leaders, academy, political leaders from the different levels of the federal, state, and, and municipal uh, 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 levels to bring to the, 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 the table and to design uh, 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 a new future for the region. In this direction, we have been trying to create. Uh, first of all, I applause uh, in this direction the the, the initiative of the science uh, science panel, uh, and we are connected to other uh, actors uh, around a movement called a concertation, a great concertation for Amazon, uh, built uh, to, pre, trying to design this, this, this future. In this process, uh, I would like to, 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 to finish my very quick introduction, introduction uh, sharing one interesting thing that connects to to Carlos uh, uh, open uh, one of the presenters in one of the webinars uh, that we the, the consultation had promoted uh, the the archaeologist Eduardo uh, from the, the USP and other uh, important universities, told us about the story the, 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 of Amazon and brought us the, 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 the news that there are many scientific evidence that the forest is the product of more than 10,000 years of interaction between men and nature. Just in the last 50 years, as Carlos said, we have we create the economy of destruction, of deforestation. Our challenge is to change this. Let's bring together, uh, let, let's bring to uh, another time the economy of life, the economy uh, of the web of life, as would say Fritjord Capra, or bioeconomy, as we used to say today. And this is my first initial thought that I would like to share with you. And with this, I open the floor to my dearest uh, uh, Andrea Alvarez, that will uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Natura's experience, the 20 plus years of Natura's experience in, in the region. Please, Andrea, go ahead. Mm, thank, thank you, Guilherme, very much. It's always a pleasure to hear you talk so passionately about what we need to do collectively about the Amazon so that we create this Amazon we all want. And I'm really pleased to be here today to discuss sustainable development pathways for the region, a cause that is so dear to Natura, as Guilherme just, just uh, talked about. We've been participating as a member in the discussions held by the Strategic Committee of the Science Panel for the Amazon, and I'm really confident and hopeful 
that the scientific work and the policy recommendations that come out from of these discussions are going to push us to deliver strong and urgent responses that are needed, as Carlos also mentioned earlier. Um, in one of the meetings recently, the conversation was centered in the need for the Amazon to be managed as a system and that the deforestation effects go way beyond the Amazon. So it is crucial to connect the different stakeholders that are involved in this matter, as Guilherme just mentioned, and create this web of life instead of the web of destruction. <laughs> so um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So at Natura, we, we've always believed that no one can solve any problem by themselves, the interdependency that Guilherme was just mentioned. And we're really passionate about this idea that it is possible to find different ways to do business and that we can balance economic, social, and environmental positive impact. Uh, we see sustainability as a leverage to create value. Uh, when we look at social and economic and social and environmental challenges, as business opportunities and as society opportunities, we usually come out with innovations that help us find the path forward. And that's what we've been doing in the Amazon for more than two decades now. As Guilherme said, in the late 90s, we started exploring that ecosystem and trying to understand it better. Uh, and then our relationship really flowed as of the year 2000 when we launched Echoes. Uh, and started using these you know, biodiversity ingredients in our cosmetics. It was a huge challenge. And we intensified this presence of, a few years later when we decided to directly engage with the communities as, as, as sourcing uh, engagements for us. And then we further enhanced that connection in the year tw um, 2011 with the launch of, of our Natura Amazonia program. And the key objective here was to create sustainable business uh, and promote local development based on science, innovation, entrepreneurship, but also valuing the social biodiversity, the traditional knowledge and the local culture, because it is in that combination that we think uh, solutions can arise that are um, good for all. In 2014, we uh, opened uh, one of our production sites called Ecoparque. It's an industrial park in Benevides in Pará. And the purpose was to attract partners who actually shared common views of sustainable development for the region. And then later on, we identified that there was actually a potential for that site to become a, you know, an advanced bio-based innovation science unit for us. And that's what it also evolved to become later on. And then in 2018, we were awarded the Union for Ethical Biotrade certification, uh, which for us was an honor because it underscored our commitment to fair trade and biodiversity conservation. And then more recently, we launched our Living Amazon cause based on the principle that the forest is worth a lot more for everyone if we keep it standing. <laughs> and then later on June this year, we as a group, now as a Naturin co-group, we launched what we're calling our commitment to life, which is our sustainability vision. It's actually a strategic vision for 2030 that aims to foster collective efforts towards zero deforestation in the Amazon region by 2025 so that we do not reach that tipping point that we all, you know, that um, Carlos has talked about so many times that, that we want to avoid at all costs. And the, the way we, we want to do this is by expanding the use of social technologies and promote green economy based uh, solutions using sustainably biodiversity products and services. So the idea is to create a social economic model through which the Amazon region would no longer be exclusive a supplier of raw materials, but it would reveal and value its technological vocation. Um, also valuing its culture and driving the emergence of opportunities that can deliver more relevant benefits for society at large and for that region. So next slide, please. So let's look at a few big numbers. Our goal is to expand our presence in the region even further. Today, we, we have ties with 33 local communities numbering more than 5,000 families and almost 20,000 people. Um, sustainable harvesting has proven its value as a source of income for these families and also as social progress indicators. And in the last 10 years, we've had a community, community cumulative business volume of 1.8 billion reais in the region, which is pretty much $350 million. Um, and these efforts, and I think this is the most um, incredible, is that through those efforts, we've managed to um, keep 1.8 million hectares of forest standing, which is impressive. I mean, it's half the size of, of 
a country like Holland, but it's not enough. We know it's not enough. And that's why one company can't do it this alone. What we can do is share the best models we have so that maybe more companies and, and thinking can actually also flow to that region. So let me give you a specific case, which we, we like to tell the story because I think it, it tells, it gives life to this whole idea that, you know, when we're just talking conceptually, it's sometimes hard to comprehend. Um, so next slide, please. We have um, a great story of the ukuba tree and the, um, the ukuba fruit, the ukubeda. The ukubeda, the ukuba tree and ukuba, the fruit. In 2015, we launched um, a product line using ukuba as a key biodiversity ingredient. And ukuba is known as the Amazon jewel. It was inspired by traditional knowledge uh, and it took us years, really years of research. And we're still not completely happy with the final like, outcome. We love it, but we always want to tweak it a little bit more, but it's an amazing product in terms of hydration. Um, and, but, it, but it shows that the challenge of actually in, engaging with these biodiversity ingredients and transforming these in cosmetic products that are exceptional in their performance uh, and usability. But we cracked that code <laughs> and um, we found out this, this formulation where we used uh, the ukuba seed because it, you, it, it releases a bomb that has really intensive hydrating properties and stimulates the, the production of co collagen, like naturally producing collagen by the skin. Um, and the story is that before the use of, of ukuba as a cosmetic alternative, the local communities really saw very little economic value in the tree. Uh, they actually were chopping it down. Uh, it was on the verge of becoming extinct because it was felled and it was used for to make broomsticks and, and other petty, petty instruments. When we started to manufacture the cosmetics with Ukuba butter, we established the sustainable harvesting model that provided this new source of income for these communities, especially for women. So through this financial return assessment that we conducted, we uh, were able to see that the annual harvest of a preserved Ukubeda generates three times more income for the communities than logging. So making this a really great example of how the forest is worth more standing than felt. And then by building these relationships with their local communities and empowering them uh, and innovating to develop even greener cosmetics, we are actually advancing on our quest to generate positive impact through business model and daily on a daily basis because these relationships, they evolve continuously. Uh, next slide, please. But we knew that we needed more and more people to join us on this journey and we needed to gain scale. And that's why we launched um, in June, like I mentioned, our commitment to life, which is this vision for the Natur Co group that also includes Avon, the body shop in ESOP. And it was born out of this aspiration that we would dare to innovate, to promote positive economic, social, environmental impact, which has been really a, a motivator and a driver for the company for so many years, for so many years. And we would do so by addressing in a transverse, transversal and systemic way with the help of many others. So as a, as a consultation, as, as Guilherme says, the most pressing issues that we face. And one of these challenges we aim to address is the deforestation of the Amazon. So here are some of the targets that are related to our living Amazon cause. But as I mentioned, we are aware that we're not going to achieve zero deforestation by ourselves. We need collective action. So next slide, so that I can wrap up. Uh, so just another quick example uh, is and, the... Andrea, just, uh, yes? just to say that because we're running a little late, I just wanted to uh, make sure that the other couple of speakers have a chance yeah. and they would have five minutes each. Okay, no, so I'm wrapping up. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. thank you, sorry. I, I really, I was wrapping uh, The Medjo Juro is a place where we're, we, we've been doing amazing work uh, and it's territory development. So that's the only thing that I wanted to talk about. It's territorial development so that we can collectively with investment agencies also um, create um, positive outcomes. So with that, I'll skip the video maybe because I think I should just stop and I'll hand over to Susanna so she can take it from here.
Oop, I'm, am I on? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk about the, uh, in, in this very short time, I'm going to talk about um, the amount of value that's generated globally in uh, Amazonian germplasm. And I've just taken a few things. I haven't done um, a, a, a more general thing. It's just to give you an impression. And then I want to talk about the existing Amazonian technologies that could be deployed in the processes of, um, trans, uh, of uh, economic and um, uh, livelihood production for the region. And then, and I'm going to give you three big technologies, which actually are in place and well established and could be uh, a part of a system systemic way of looking at this. What I would argue is that so much of Amazonian development has taken as its model northern European uh, uh, views of landscape, which are open and with annual crops, as opposed to trees and tubers, which remain the sort of archetypal form of Amazonian economic and livelihood development. Well, anyway, one of the things I just wanted to show is that you know, we're really heating up very, very extensively. And you can see that this is, we're having probably the hottest year ever. Um, I'm looking forward next in the next couple of days to 115 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit in the LA basin and 130 degrees, one of the hottest temperatures ever recorded on the planet was recorded in Death Valley a couple of weeks ago. So it's important to understand that uh, we are in we're we're in more of a crisis than perhaps we realize, and that the other thing is that the characteristics of the tropics are expanding. So that there's lots that maybe we could learn. Next slide, please. Well, I just did this as a sort of uh, quick uh, a quick back of the envelope thing, but I wanted to point out a few things, which is that most of the value of Amazonian germplasm is, has been elaborated and technolo technologically um, expanded outside of the region. So one of the things that's really important to think about is how you uh, keep value added within the region. Because right now, uh, this germplasm has been moved all over the world for the most part, and also that most of the value that is accrued to it has not stayed in Amazonia. So I just go through a few commodities here the big ones globally, but you can see that even uh, acai and Brazil nuts generate about a billion dollars and uh, are very high in their rate of employment. But you can see that with these other these other commodities, and I could add a much broader list, by the way, that we're really looking at half a trillion dollars. And these were just numbers from la either last year or the year before. So just what I could snag rather quickly. But you can see that the Amazonian germplasm has the capacity to generate really extraordinary amounts of, uh, of revenue in their global trade, but that the problem that we have with Amazonia is a kind of colonial problem, which is all the value is transported out. Okay, so one, so that's my first point. There's lots of value in those forests and not even talking about uh, environmental services, which a recent study estimates to be, you take, if you include everything, to be about $5,000 uh, per hectare. Okay, so we're talking about a place that actually is being destroyed for uh, a, an extraordinary source of value and virtue that's being destroyed for uh, very short-term unsustainable uses. Next slide, please. Well, First of all, there are tech complex technologies in place. They're indigenous technologies, by the way, um, that uh, give us resilience and durability uh, in this region. And these are socio environments in the sense that the environment itself is also doing a lot of the work. You know, what we have is an input model where you have the you have your soy plant and then you put all the inputs in and then it does stuff. And what you have in the indigenous models of all of which is this, is that nature itself is doing a lot of the inputs, uh, whether these are microbes, whether these are uh, trees, whether these are the aquatic systems themselves. Um, 
So the, I'm going to go quickly through three of them. I call them the three A's. Um, one is the Amazonian dark earths. This is uh, um, so let's let's go to that next slide, please. And these are found all over. Uh, it's a, basically a soil, an anthropogenic soil, um, which means that it's created by people. It's done by soil improvement. And one of the things that I always point out is that if you look at the kinds of things that make uh, areas habitable that seem marginal, so that marginal areas like mountain areas or areas that are very dry, what you have are technologies that transform these areas into productive sites. Now, one of the things that's very characteristic of Amazonia is that but a lot of the soils are quite poor. Um, they're acid soils, highly weathered, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is with these anthropogenic soils, essentially you have a fertility set of practices that give you a, um, a soil uh, that is very productive and it's durable. Most of the Terra Preta sites, the Amazonian darker sites that we're looking at, are, are hundreds of years old and many of them thousands of years old simply because the internal processes of, of microbial growth and organic matter holding are, uh, are elaborated within them. So think of this as being on a par at a geographical scale as with, uh, and as a soil management innovation on a par with irrigation and on a par with terracing. So we know that you can get a lot of productivity, you can get a lot of livelihood goods out of these kinds of technologies, soil management technologies. And here's an indigenous one, it's found all over Amazonia. These are the sites where um, th that have been mapped and documented of the Amazonian dark earth. And it's the biochar, the techniques for producing it are quite well elaborated. So uh, next slide. This is just what this looks like. So these are these are areas, this is the same soil type, one being the Amazonian dark earth. This is about a 700 year old soil, anthropogenic soil that's still extremely fertile and extremely viable versus the other one, which if you <clears throat> were to put agriculture on it would become unviable in a few years. So this is just to uh, emphasize that there are certainly technologies in place and management techniques that you could be using that could be durable and um, environmentally sound. Also, these are biochar sites are excellent sources of uh, uh, controlling of, of uh, carbon carbon absorption for climate change. So next slide, please. Next. Okay. Well, agroforestry. Um, this, of course, is a widely developed uh, system throughout the tropics. But Amazonia probably has more different kinds of agroforestry than you could imagine. This is, of course, an acai forest, agroforest, and it's got cacao in it, and it's got a bunch of stuff. Um, if we were to look at it, we'd probably find uh, 60 or 70 different species. But it's a landscape that is doing a lot of environmental services as well as a lot of livelihood services. And of course, the acai story is one in which, uh, first of all, I live in California, so acai is like, everyone is frantic for it all the time um, so that they can maintain their good health. Uh, but the point is that this is, a, this is a, a product, an Amazonian product that Amazonians have taught the world to enjoy. Uh, again, this is one of the great success stories with uh, high levels of employment and uh, a sustainable system and, but there are many of these. There are many hundreds of agroforestry systems and land management systems throughout Amazonia, which can become, as they say, platforms for livelihood and for economic change. The other thing, but you have to invest in them. You can't just sort of be extracting them. And the other thing is that a lot of these agroforestry systems and the complex forests that have been that have been the outcome of the terraforming of indigenous populations in Amazonia, a lot of them are going very quickly. Seven, more than 7,000 fires are burning as we speak right now. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so here's um, aquatic, uh, an aquatic agroforestry system. But the point that I also wanted to make is that uh, not only do we have a sort of monoculture episteme, by which I mean the way that we understand productive landscapes is through monocultures in in the uh, in the Western world for the most part, uh, but also that we think of it as dry land. And one of the things about the tropics and one of the things about a warming world is there's going to be a lot more flooding. Um, as we know, there's uh, uh, Arctic and Antarctic ice shelves are uh, flopping away as again as we speak. Um, you need only look at science every week to start screaming. But the point is that there's lots of ways in which wetlands and aquatic systems are managed for livelihood production, fish production, ecological services that are extremely important. And there's huge amounts of knowledge within this. It's not knowledge that uh, we uh, train for at UC Davis or any uh, most of the universities within. Um, uh, the, the temperate zone, but these are systems that are complex and they require an ecological view of the world and also what I would say is an aquatic episteme, the way of thinking about the world as being formed by water. Now about a third of Amazonia is in, um, is in uh, wetlands of various kinds. Also you have side lakes and various forms of water management and resource management and fishery management within these that are extremely important and extremely productive. So the point on this is simply that, you know, we there are extraordinary amounts of wealth. There's extraordinarily interesting and how shall we say time-tested technologies that are available to be thinking about how you might uh, elaborate a, uh, a, a, a an economy based on standing forests and flowing rivers. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this is a little bit more about the uh, aquatic systems. These are the, the raised fields of the Beni. These are the open grasslands that are periodically flooded. And what you can see in this is that this is not, and this looks industrial, uh, but it's, uh, it, and it is industrial in the sense that it's made by human industry over time. The big line in the center is a road that's coming through this. But the point is that you had large scale landscape transformations of very high productivity. So the empty Amazon, the Amazon that's at the end of the world and the beginnings of time with the prehistoric human beings on it, you actually had very complex civilizations. This is something that we can recognize perhaps if we look at an aquatic uh, uh, agroforestry system, we can't see it, but this is something that you can recognize because of its geometry and its openness. Um, but the point being that there are very complex societies that uh, elaborated great civilizations and also had the production systems on which to base these. Next slide. This is a, so that's the Beni that I'm showing you. This is on the other side of the Amazon. This is in, uh, this is the work of Stéphane Rosnin uh, in, uh, in Cayenne. And again, what you see are these raised bed systems and large mounds and complex interactions between terrestrial management and water, uh, watered system management, which is part of the story of how large scale uh, extensive civilizations with large populations um, elaborated in these areas. So these are these raised mounds and uh, um, uh, raised mound systems. Next slide, please. Well, I put a Chinapas in. Um, this is, of course, Mexico. Um, uh, but the point is that we're See, going to be seeing a world that's a lot more flooded and a lot more flooding in the tropics. Um, and so perhaps it behooves us to look a little bit more intensively at the kinds of complex systems of that integrated land and water and trees and tubers, as well as uh, open landscapes and also that integrated fisheries and uh, uh, aquatic uh, wetlands into the production system so that they maintain both ecological complexity as well as uh, 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 agro agroecological complexity, and also that's based in 
social complexity within these societies and uh, the high diversity of cultural chain cultural types that you have. So one of the things is to keep in mind that there we we have a world coming up that is look, going to look a lot different very quickly, uh, uh, and that the technologies for handling that changing world um, reside largely in the tropics. The next slide, please. Um, well, one of the things is that not only do you have to have technologies, but you have to have institutions, you have to have inclusive ones, you have to have questions of human rights. Uh, I always like this slide because it has uh, basically the Kayapa um, uh, J groups from uh, uh, central Brazil and southern Amazonia who were part of the uh, Constitution Convention in Brazil in 1988. I like to contrast this with the Constitution Convention of the United States, which was largely white men. Um, this was just a picture of a much more complex story, which was much more inclusive in the construction of a, a very interesting, although currently quite under attack on both sides, it has to be said, um, uh, uh, set of constitutions that guaranteed land rights to indigenous populations, guaranteed environmental rights and environmental concerns, and um, were much more socially inclusive in the creation of these documents. Now, again, we can talk about the current moment, but um, what you can see is that there's kind of a difference between uh, slaveholding white men who were soon rapidly depleting the indigenous populations versus the kind of dynamism that we began to see in 1988. Of course, before that as well. Um, next slide, please. Well, uh, first of all, I guess the thing is that we have, we, have, we have this extraordinarily complex thing. And I don't want to just sort of say the thing about Amazonia is it has to be all utilitarian. It doesn't have to be all utilitarian. But at this juncture, the development model itself is flawed and it's particularly flawed under the conditions of high inequality that prevail and also the levels of violence. The other thing is that the land transformation model really only evaluates the uh, value of production that flows into um, recognizable markets of various kinds. And one of the things it doesn't take into account is the loss, the externalities, the cost in terms of biodiversity, in terms of environmental services, in terms of uh, social, uh, social costs and out migration. Um, and so one of the, and, and uh, dispossession that is very characteristic of these regions. So one of the things is that while um, we may see increasing GDPs and the importance of export uh, products, that the cost of producing these and the cost of poisoning those landscapes in order to produce soy with uh, Roundup Ready soy um, is predicated on pretending that there's no cost to this other than the cost of purchasing the input when in fact there are huge ramifying costs. So if we were to really do, as they say, full cost accounting, we would find that perhaps the land transformation model was much more costly than the revenue it was generating. The other thing is this problem of disarticulated accumulation. That is that most of the wealth that's generated even now doesn't stay there. There's a few models where it does, acai being one, uh, another being Brazil nuts in the Western Amazon. But the point is- I'm so is, sorry, Susanna. Yeah, I know <laughs> we're gonna get, I'll, I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, so the point is that we have a problem of simply extraction. Um, the investment strategies focus on moving resources out, not on value added in. Um, and then we have current very limited investment in human capital in in Amazonia and the problems right, right now of authoritarian development. Uh, next slide, I think this is it. Next slide. Well, this is, of course, how you use up your future. Um, uh, I'm always reminded of the great Marlena Dietrich's line to Orson Welles as he's about to be shot. And he says to her, read, you know, fortune, she's a fortune teller in this movie. It's the movie, it's the touch of evil. And she says, fortune teller, read my hand. And he says, she reads it and says, future, you have no future. Your future is all used up. Um, and we would really hate 
for this moment to turn around and actually have the sort of ghost of Marlena Dietrich turn to us and say, your future is used up. So it's really imperative that we recast and rethink what a few Amazonian future might look like. And the irony is that the answers are already in place. That's it. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, we have Professor Ricardo Abramove. Professor? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, many thanks for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, Susana, Andrea, Gazadu, uh, Guilherme, uh, Carlos, and uh, in this uh, event. Well, I'm coordinating with Joyce Ferreira from Embrapa, Occidental Amazon, the group which is working on in the science panel on bioeconomy. And my first movement as a researcher uh, was to look at the scientific and public policy literature in, on bioeconomy. And what I have found out was shocking. Not only the Amazon, but more generally, the tropical forests are completely outside from this literature. The German Bioeconomy Council published an inquiry with more than 4,000 experts from 46 countries on the issue. The variety of products and services coming from bioeconomy is striking and concerns all dimensions of social life from agriculture and food sector with alternative protein sources to new materials and energy. A, a, a huge amount of products, services, etc. But the report doesn't even mention tropical forests as a field of uh, research. In the recently published report of the Sciences, Medicine and Engineering Academies from the United States, the three academies together, you neither find something on tropical forests. The report estimates that the bioeconomy in the US is a trillion dollar sector with at least 5% of the US GDP. But as with the German report, tropical forests are not mentioned in the report. This absence is very worrisome, not only because of the loss of, the, of economic opportunities, uh, that it represents, but also because the bioeconomy is seen nowadays as one of the main pillars of the sustainable development goals, the one that could enhance our societies toward a circular economy. In my view, one of the main conclusions of the science panel is that Latin America wants to reduce the gap between the Amazon forest and the scientific and technological frontier of bioeconomy. It's desirable that enterprises, civil society, international cooperation and governments establishes goals in this direction. There are a, a lot of conditions to uh, reduce this gap legal conditions, property rights, intellectual rights are among the most important. But let me mention four points, four conditions for our discussion. The first one concerns the title of this meeting, scale. Scale do not suppose homogeneity or absence of diversity, social, geo, bio diversity. As uh, Susanna and Andrea showed uh, just a few moments ago, the tropical forest bioeconomy is 
inherently an economic, an economy of diversity, diversity of territories, of people, of products, of service, of markets. Scale can't be considered as the opposite of diversity, as in the traditional agricultural activities. Forest products and service can be scaled not only by the link between forest people and enterprises, but also by agroforestry systems and by the integration between forest products and industries like animal nutrition or micronutrients turned to replace pesticides in agriculture. There are a lot of successful initiatives in this direction in this direction that will be mentioned in our report in the science panel. The main message is scale and diversity have to come together in the case of the bioeconomy of the tropical forests, the social bioeconomy of the tropical forests. The second condition is the investment in education, science and technology in the Amazon. Leticia agreement mentions it and is strategic if you want a nature-based knowledge economy to emerge. Let me quote just one example, uh, quote frequently by uh, Denis Minev. Uh, the main Brazilian Amazon research institution has a budget about $15 million. Just Stanford University has a budget of $6 billion. There is already an important team of scholars in the region whose activities have to be improved, improved with more investments. The third condition is the necessary rethinking of the infrastructure in the Amazon. We know that infrastructure is a set of devices that determine the paths of economic growth. Until now, the dominant thinking on infrastructure is fundamentally turned toward commodities, whereas people don't have electric energy, internet, basic sanitation, and access to health. An economy of forest social biodiversity has the potential to deliver some of the local solutions to the infrastructure of the Amazon population. The fourth condition is perhaps the most important. Every ambitious project, as Guilherme Leal told us in the beginning of the, our meeting, every ambitious project must be supported by some values, ethical values. In our case, the value what that we are talking about could be stated in my view as follows the forest is a common good of the human species and its use must be governed by the respect both for its its biological diversity and for the richness of the spiritual and material culture of the peoples that inhabit it. The forest is not only instrumental, its conservation is a value per se. This value of the forest doesn't imply economic stagnation as the Pre Susanna presentation showed just now. It's an invitation for something that belonged to the Green New Deal, an economic life whose dynamism supposes a nature-based knowledge economy. That's it. Thank you. Hello. Uh, now we have uh, uh, Mr. Gasuda uh, Surui, who is the founder of the Indigenous Cultural Center, uh, Wago Pakoop, and a member of the Science Panel for the Amazon. And uh, you will uh, have uh, 10 minutes to present, and after that, we will have some questions. O senhor fala inglês? Ou vai falar em português? 
Coimbra, na verdade, nós vamos exibir um vídeo do senhor Gazeta ah, da Graça. Okay. Ah, tá bom. Bom dia, meu nome é Gazodá Suruí, sou indígena do povo Paité, Suruí, aqui de Rondônia, da terra indígena 7 de setembro. Eu pertenço ao clã Amep, que é um dos quatro grupos clânicos que compõem a sociedade Paité. Então, eu pertenço ao grupo Amep, que em português significa... Maribondo Preto, e eu sou formado em turismo, mestre em geografia e atualmente estou fazendo um doutorado em geografia pela Universidade Federal de Rondônia. É, eu sou coordenador do Centro Cultural Agupacô, que é uma iniciativa do povo Paité, para trabalhar com fortalecimento da cultura Paité e, ao mesmo tempo, com valorização e preservação das nossas florestas e do nosso território. É, há 20 anos atrás, ingresso de um indígena dentro de uma universidade era o nosso maior desafio. Hoje, todo ano, entra 10, 15 suruí na universidade. Então, isso para nós é uma conquista. Então, por isso que eu falo que nada é impossível, né? Para quem sempre está buscando dias melhores para seu povo e para a sociedade, qual faz parte, né? Que é o nosso caso. Hoje nós estamos tentando buscar melhores qualidades de vida para o nosso povo e, ao mesmo tempo, tentando contribuir com a sociedade com o nosso pensamento, com a nossa visão de futuro, né? Então, hoje, é, através desses estudantes que estão na universidade, hoje nós estamos tendo essa oportunidade de criar próprios pesquisadores indígenas dentro da academia, que, é uma, que era uma coisa que não existia no passado. Os nossos anciões, que são nossos maiores conhecimentos, que hoje a maior, maioria já não estão entre nós, foi perda muito grande. Então, o nosso conhecimento, o repasse do nosso conhecimento era só na base da oralidade. Hoje, o que nós aprendemos com nossos pais, com nossos avós, e, e o que nós aprendemos dentro da universidade, hoje ela é publicado. Então, isso já é diferente. Então, isso significa que o que nós, povos indígenas, pensamos em relação à nossa vida já se torna público. Então, isso para nós já é uma conquista. Então, o que falta hoje, nesse sentido, é que as pessoas reconheçam o que nós, povos indígenas, pensamos. Que as pessoas reconheçam quando o índio fala que ela precisa ter seu território garantido, que ela precisa ter sua cultura valorizada e respeitada, não é da boca para fora. É porque ela realmente sente que precisa aquilo para viver. Nós, povos indígenas, sempre cuidamos o que é nosso, né? principalmente o nosso território. Antigamente, as terras indígenas não era demarcado, não era reconhecido pelo governo, pela sociedade. Hoje, a maioria das terras indígenas aqui no Brasil são demarcados, homologado pelo governo. Então, para fazer melhor gestão do nosso território, nós fizemos diagnósticos étnicos ambientais participativos do nosso território e gerou em manual para orientar o povo paiter, não só a geração de agora, mas no futuro, de como que nós podemos usar, cuidar o nosso território. Então, a partir disso, criamos vários trabalhos, projetos, que hoje estão sendo executados aqui dentro do território. 
Então, dentro da área de proteção, nós criamos um grupo de agentes ambientais indígenas, que são pessoas que trabalham diretamente na questão de fiscalização do entorno da área, que estão sempre cuidando os recursos naturais que tem dentro da floresta. E nesse pequeno espaço que nós temos, nós temos que cuidar, proteger de todo sentido o que tem lá dentro para nós oferecer, para nossa alimentação, nossa cultura, nossa saúde, nossa educação. Então, por isso que nós, povos indígenas, nosso caso aqui, Paité, através desse plano de gestão, criamos um gestão que realmente procura sempre trabalhar com a proteção do nosso território e assim nós é, criamos, capacitamos esses pessoais para trabalhar direto na questão de proteção e fiscalização da terra indígena. Porque o que nós, povos indígenas, fazemos pela, pelo planeta, principalmente na questão da floresta em pé, contribui não só para nós, para muitas pessoas, no sentido da, do equilíbrio de mudanças climáticas, que realmente garante o bem viver para cada um. Então, através de nossas pesquisas, como próprios pesquisadores indígenas, a gente está escrevendo, a gente está publicando isso. Não é como era no passado. Pessoa de, vim, de fora vir fazer pesquisa junto com a gente e escrever não da, da forma que nós pensamos. Então, hoje é diferente. Nós próprios indígenas estamos escrevendo o que nós pensamos, junto com nossa família, junto com a nossa comunidade e junto com o nosso povo. Então, o que falta é essa, esse reconhecimento por todos, né? pela universidade, pelo governo e pelas organizações que trabalham direto com a questão indígena. Porque eu acredito que se tivesse diálogo de construção e de reconhecimento da importância de cada um aqui, será muito promissor o que nós queremos pensar para o futuro do nosso povo, da nossa sociedade, de uma maneira coletiva. O conhecimento de cada povo é importante na vida de todo mundo. O conhecimento dos povos indígenas é importante para a sociedade brasileira, assim como também é importante para a vida do povo indígena. O problema para resolver a nossa vida dentro está tá dentro do conhecimento de qualquer povo. Então, por isso que nós, povos, temos que valorizar o conhecimento de cada um. E para que... É, a sociedade tem acesso a esse conhecimento, é preciso que tenha essa junção. O conhecimento indígena junto com o conhecimento não indígena e o conhecimento não indígena junto com o conhecimento indígena. Então, assim, vale para outras comunidades também. Comunidades tradicionais, quilombolas, porque eu acredito que cada povo com sua cultura tem seu conhecimento em toda área de conhecimento, educação, cultura, meio ambiente, saúde. É... Por que, que eu estou falando isso? Hoje, em meio à pandemia, nós povos indígenas, nós estamos é... mantendo com a nossa medicina tradicional para combater esse vírus. Então, muitos estão se curando com a medicina e outros, casos mais graves, não estão precisando ir para a cidade que estão precisando ir para a cidade. Então, por isso que é, a gente ainda não sabe, é, porque algum conhecimento existe, cura para esse, esse mal. Mas só que ainda nós não sabemos em, que, em qual conhecimento de, de, em, é, de povo está essa solução de problema para nós. Então, por isso que nós temos que acreditar em várias formas de conhecimento de cada povo. Porque nós, povos indígenas, queremos muito bem contribuir e 
ao mesmo tempo que queremos que as pessoas reconheçam isso, aceitem e dizer para nós, estamos aqui, vamos à luta junto. Então é isso que nós queremos hoje. Através dessa, dessa conquista de espaço que nós temos hoje. E nós estamos prontos né? para lutar junto. Branco, negro, índio. Então cabe a nós essa oportunidade. A gente levar o nosso conhecimento em vários âmbitos, principalmente dentro da academia, para que o nosso conhecimento tenha conhecimento de todos. E assim a gente tentar buscar, encaminhar de que forma a gente pode procurar entender melhor para que ela possa realmente contribuir para o futuro melhor da humanidade. Né? Bom, eu só gostaria de dizer que eu estou feliz né, por fazer parte do painel, né? porque para mim foi uma surpresa. Ao mesmo tempo, a gente está sempre acreditando que a gente pode chegar longe, né? Porque cada dia que passa nós estamos conquistando o nosso espaço, nosso trabalho está sendo reconhecido, então isso é muito importante. E para mim fazer parte do painel também eu entendo dessa forma. Para mim é uma é uma conquista para mim. Então eu fico muito feliz de poder estar sempre contribuindo. Nossa com I'm hoping you... meu conhecimento, né, como povo indígena Paiter e mostrar para o mundo quem é o Carlos, povo Paiter, né? porque precisamos levar a luta e o nome do nosso povo para o mundo inteiro, porque como eu falei, o mundo inteiro. todos nós precisamos porque conhecer falei, um outro, todos nós precisamos conhecer um outro. Wimber, back to you. Okay. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for this really fascinating uh, session. Uh, I don't have time to summarize. I think we had better open up right away to questions given the time. Um, so the first, uh, the first question. Uh, Is there anyone uh, in the science panel working with development of models for bioeconomy in the Amazon region of Colombia? How is the panel tackling the rapid expansion of cattle production? I think we just better start with one. This is from Jessica Lopez. Is there anyone in the science panel working with development of models for bioeconomy in the Amazon region of Colombia? And if so, how's it going? Ricardo ou Suzana? Ricardo ou Suzana? Suzana, you are Suzana, you are Susana, you may need to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, there we go. Um, the, there, there is uh, a lot of work being done on the bioeconomies of all of Western Amazonia. It's an area that has a long history of medicinal and psychotropic plants. Um, uh, I, as I say, I live in California where, you know, the psychotropic plants are extraordinary interest and also used not just uh, for spiritual advancement, but also on using things like ayahuasca on, for questions of, um, of uh, uh, dealing with addiction, uh, which is of course a general problem. The, the issue is, which I raised in my presentation, is that there's lots of value that's being generated that exists in Amazonia, but the elaboration of its complexity and the capture of its value 
is occurring outside. So uh, outside of the Amazon. Uh, so one of the central problems is how does one capture the value and use it to invest in the Amazon and to improve uh, the general well-being. The problem that exists is, of course, the bio what, the biopiracy problem. Um, more generally, in the question that was also raised about issues of property and intellectual rights, uh, indigenous knowledge systems and their rights over these. These are not very well resolved, um, and so these these remain complex questions. But there's been a lot of work on the bioeconomy and potential bioeconomies of Colombia. Not to mention that it's key in one of the largest economies based on Amazonian production, uh, which is coca. But all of the other ones. Okay. Uh Let's, can you hear me? I'm so sorry about yes. yes. Okay, yes, so the next question uh, uh, for uh, for Mr. Gasoda, Surwi. Uh, primeiro, uh, aquele que faz a pergunta diz, é uma honra ter você falando nesse painel. Eu gostaria de saber o que as pessoas não indígenas podem fazer para fortalecer a sua luta. É, aqui horário de Rondônia são 11h26, então ainda aqui é bom dia, né? Uhum. <risos> bom dia. É. Então, é... onde nós chegamos, para nós já é uma conquista. Então, eu acredito que é, cada dia que passa, nós estamos em busca de dias melhores para todos, né? Como eu falei no vídeo, para todos nós, humanos, seres humanos do planeta Terra. E, então, cada dia que passa, é, o nosso trabalho como povo indígena, gestão coletiva do nosso território, uso sustentável do nosso território, está sendo é, reconhecido pelo mundo. Então, isso para nós já é um motivo de muita alegria, né? Então, eu acredito que é, isso nós já deixa fortalecido. Então, é, então, então, a ideia é que cada dia que passa, mais gente venha acreditar que os povos indígenas precisam ser respeitados. Porque não é à toa que eles defendem o futuro da humanidade através da preservação das florestas, dos territórios da Amazônia. Então, porque, de alguma forma, manter a floresta em pé pode beneficiar a vida humana. Através de... Então, é isso que nós, povos, acreditamos. Povos indígenas acreditamos. Então, cada dia que passa, as pessoas reconhecem isso. Então, é, então a gente acredita que as pessoas que reconhecem o nosso trabalho falem do nosso trabalho, do nosso povo, para a sua família, para o seu povo, para o seu município, para o seu estado, e assim multiplicar as vozes do conhecimento do povo indígena que pode muito bem contribuir para o futuro da humanidade. Então, é isso que nós esperamos, através de escola, através de universidade, através de organizações não governamentais que trabalham com os povos indígenas, principalmente essa informação, essa realidade, chegar até ouvido das nossas autoridades, dos nossos governos, que são hoje os nossos maiores desafio para o reconhecimento e a importância da, da luta dos povos indígenas hoje no Brasil. Então, a gente espera chegar dessa forma, conquistar cada um, um por um, até chegar numa instância maior e assim a gente poder dizer que alcançamos o nosso objetivo, que é de contribuir um futuro melhor para o nosso país. 
Então é assim, dessa forma que nós, povos indígenas, pensamos com a nossa conquista de cada dia. Então, todo dia a nossa luta é importante. Muito, muito, muito obrigada. Uh, então, uh, a próxima, the next uh, question is from Luciana Cesarino, and uh, this is for uh, Mr. Leal. Is the strategy of working by collab with collaborative, uh, collaboratively with communities in the Amazon a way to empower those individuals and communities? There are some legal criticisms about your methods. Could you uh, speak a little about that? Hello. Are you here? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a long relationship, story of relationship with communities. We started, uh, uh, we, we helped to build, to build the legislation of the, the, the uh, how do you say? Uh, Andrea, may you help me a little bit about this, but we have been involved in the, the, the enhancement of the legislation and the, the learning about how to be to be connected to different communities and to empower them to 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 help them to enhance the, their community, the quality of life uh, uh, as a whole, uh, to, uh, being partner uh, of those communities, uh, uh, the social leaders and uh, connecting uh, in many different ways uh, uh, than with the needs, the, 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 the ones that provide their needs. So uh, I think we have a, 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 an interesting story. It's a challenging, as we said, it's a learning, a continuous learning process. We deal with this with uh, a uh, high degree of transparency, trying to learn day after day. Uh, as uh, Gazoda says, the, 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 the culture, the knowledge of uh, indigenous peoples, non-indigenous non business people, local people, uh, ribeirinhos, uh, quilombolas, and, uh, and so on, uh, 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 we, we we try to produce this network of knowledge and and sharing value uh, uh, i i think perhaps andrea could help me a little bit yeah let, let me pitch in a little bit uh yes we we do measure the progress and the empowerment of the economic activities and social activities and institutional activities with which we engage with the different communities in the amazon and, and yes, we were part of the, uh, we really influenced the biodiversity law in Brazil in the early 2000s as, as an organization. And we, we worked together to create the legislative um, framework that would help. We have been doing this and sharing back both in the investments that have been made in the, in the region with the sourcing of the materials and with access benefit sharing be it for traditional knowledge and cultural heritage or biodiversity access. And I think, I guess the, the two indicators we have that, you know, although not perfect, that we are evolving the model and, and continuously working towards giving back and empowering these organizations, these, these communities to be able to actually thrive is that we have never had um, monopolistic approaches. They are you know, free to negotiate with whomever they want since the beginning. There is no uh, concentration of, of, of any uh, uh, resource that we buy from them. And we have worked with them in, in strengthening their um, cooperative or community resilience with institutions. And I think when we were awarded the Union for Ethical Bio, Bio Trade seal from UEBT two years ago, I think that's a third party endorsement that uh, 
we are doing the best that is currently available. Uh, but like Gilemi said, this is an ongoing program of learning and improving and learning and improving. And just so one quick thing, well, I just wanted to wrap up on one final thing is uh, in Colombia for the previous question, Natura has initiated work with uh, um, both Anjirova and um, Anjirova and, and Kupuasu uh, with bioeconomic models in the regions of Caquetá and Lechicia, and we're learning from those as well. So that, that was my contribution. So here's a question for Carlos, I think, <clears throat> from Marc uh, Jarlet. Uh, how can we scale ecosystem conservation activities in a way that they don't conflict with the needs of indigenous peoples? Uh, and uh, I, I think along those lines, uh, um, how do you protect the uh, investments of indigenous peoples and how do you decide who's provided the information? Uh, well, I will be brief because we are uh, exceeding our uh, plan time. Uh, of course, the, the Amazon is, is still very large. We have uh, obviously the obligation to demarcate all indigenous territories to, to really to give much more uh, to respect indigenous rights to their territories. Uh, so there is still a lot of work to do, uh, keeping in mind uh, also that indigenous people, uh, as Susanna mentioned, I mean, they, they practice agroecology for 12,000 years in the Amazon. So we have to respect their, their, their way of seeing the, the value of forests, the rivers. Uh, so, but of course, the, the Amazon is is very large in terms of forest. So it's quite possible to have, to respect indigenous rights in their territories, to demarcate what's still to be demarcated, particularly in Brazil, uh, but, and also to have a huge area for conservation, for maintaining biodiversity, uh, and really to maintaining climate stability, maintaining ecosystem services, and the, the third element still totally possible because uh, the, the current model of development with the structural forest has deforested something like 1 million square kilometers, 25% uh, abandoned, very low, uh, low yield agriculture. So there is room for agroforestry systems to be also developed for use of all populations in the Amazon. So I see the, that that's actually a challenge, how you merge these three systems. One is conservation of uh, more or less intact forest. Uh, the other is really demarcating all indigenous territories, quilombola territories, protecting traditional communities, riverine communities, all other communities. And third, you know, how to restore uh, the forests in areas which have been deforested in the last 50 years. So this is actually a big challenge for the panel. The panel in its part three is seeking for solution spaces, a sustainable pathway, and we have very large number of authors and we, we had a few of them here today sharing their views. So uh, I'm very confident that uh, as we advance in making this analysis, this part three of the science panel is very important because it's not only a review of existing scientific knowledge, really, it's, it's a proposal. It's a proposal uh, that would value tremendously one word that we hear during the webinar many, many times, diversity, diversity. This is a, a, a new bioeconomy focus on diversity. It's not focused on removing the forest and replacing with one species or with one type of business. It's diversity, diversity in all senses, uh, respecting cultural diversity, all the tremendous ecosystem diversity, biodiversity, genetic diversity, uh, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems diversity. So uh, we have to build the solution pathways 
uh, on diversity uh, in all aspects. So I think uh, that, that would certainly be something very important for us to build together. And this is the first time we are really putting together all these communities, the scientific communities, other stakeholders, indigenous uh, uh, leaders, uh, like uh, like we had uh, Gazoda here showing beautifully uh, the views of the indigenous people, how they feel they must be empowered. So I see that we are really moving in the right direction, and I'm very hopeful that uh, we this uh, report, the, the science panel, will make a big difference, a big difference for respecting diversity in all dimensions in the Amazon and to construct a very different, never thought before in the last several hundred years, I would say, perhaps that's the way the indigenous people uh, developed the Amazon. They came 12,000 years ago, they kept the forest. Uh, they are in balance with all this ecological diversity, including the microorganisms. Uh, so we have really to learn a lot from that and to build this new bioeconomy. It's a very general way of describing and the Ricardo Bramovay also brought some very interesting perspectives, Susana, Guilherme Leal, and uh, Andrea, uh, that in includes this diversity and also includes improving the livelihoods of all Amazonian people, and particularly a new bioeconomy focus on the Amazonian people more than anybody else. So I think, uh, uh, Coimbra, if you, if you think uh, uh, perhaps this would be our wrap-up Comments. I think that's right. Yeah, well, and I would like really again to thank a lot uh, Gazoda, Susana, Andrea, Guilherme, uh, Ricardo, uh, Coimbra, and all the organizers. I think this was really very inspiring. I, I feel very inspired by your talks, uh, fascinating uh, visions, and we have really to build this vision. Uh, the science panel is not only to do a one-time uh, product that we are going to deliver in, in March, end of March, but really we want to construct uh, a network, a network of stakeholders, including all traditional people of the Amazon, and uh, really to build a, a, a almost permanent uh, group of, of people interested in finding the solution space to maintain the Amazon forest, its biodiversity, and particularly all its people. Thanks a lot to all of you. This was the first webinar. Thanks a lot to, to Emma Torres, to Isabella, to all of you who organized this uh, meeting. And this is the first one. We are going to have uh, a continued uh, number of webinars dealing with many aspects, but particularly seeking solutions. That's really a very important goal for the science panel. Thank you very much, all of you, and see you shortly, I hope, in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.